Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ as we begin a new church year with the study of 1 Corinthians 1, verses 3 to 9. It is hard for us to believe that we have already recorded three years of the Gospels and we are going to reissue them unless there is one of our professors who would like to re-record what they did a number of years ago. So starting now, in this first Sunday in Advent, in this Series B of Mark's Gospel, we are going to record either the Epistle lesson or the Old Testament lesson. We are going to make it the choice of the professor of that day. And I have chosen to begin this new church year and this new podcast series with the Epistle lesson from 1 Corinthians 1. It is a very appropriate lesson for the beginning of Advent. And most of you are going to be preaching on um, the Gospel, and we encourage preaching on the Gospel, but we wanted to offer some alternatives and perhaps some way in which you can have some information from the Epistle or the Old Testament lesson to add to the, uh, the preaching on the Gospel. And as we know in, in this season of Advent, you've heard this many, many times, that we are between the times. We are the, there's the three Advents, the coming of Christ um, with the Incarnation, which is what we celebrate at Christmas, Christ coming among us now in the sacraments, and then Christ coming again in glory. And, and one of the things that we do during the season of Advent is that we, we anticipate His coming again in glory and prepare ourselves for that by celebrating that He has come and continues to be among us. And this text from 1 Corinthians is a wonderful way of anticipating that coming in glory as well as preparing us for His coming. So let's, let's go to the text and look at a couple of things to start with. To begin, I, I want to point out how there are some very significant theological words here. For example, Paul begins, and we have added verse 3, the lectionary has, which is sort of the end of the prologue, the grace and peace. Um, these are words that I always teach in Galatians. They are, they are typical Pauline words, but they're words that I think you can see have a great impact on understanding you know, the nature of his greeting. Now, I, I've always thought of grace, I mean, we, we know what grace is, it's gift, but I've always thought of grace as a space, you know, um, and, and I think it has a liturgical sense there. Grace is where God is present, making right what has gone wrong, where he is justifying, where he is giving his gifts. And peace, of course, comes from the shalom. You know, th this is the peace that is in a way, an apocalyptic word in the sense that the war between, you know, um, <clears throat> man and God over sin has now been satiated. Has been, there, there is a peaceful, you know, reconciliation now in the blood of Jesus Christ. And so here we are in this grace space, and we now have this wonderful peace that comes from the atonement. Um, some of you know that I have said many times that peace is the number one word in the liturgy. You can just look it up yourself, but we begin with peace and we end with peace, and peace is just shot through the entire, the entire lectionary. You'll see that Paul repeats grace here. It's that important, and it's the grace that has been given to you in Christ Jesus. And these are, these are gifts. These are the gifts that have been given. And many people see those gifts as being speech and knowledge. I'll come back to that in a minute. But those are the gifts that I think that are given in this space that God is present offering his gifts. Okay, that, that's the first observation about the, that language. The second observation is I want you to see how many times Paul refers to Jesus Christ. Six times. You can see they're, they're all here in the yellow. So if you look carefully at this, you'll be able to see that he refers to him in verse 1, uh, excuse me, verse 3, verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, verse 7, verse 8, verse 9. Every verse Jesus is referred to. And then here you can see in verse 5 
in him, there's a, a, a reference there to Christ as well. Um, also, I want you to notice that four times he refers to him as the Lord Jesus Christ. I put it in green, so you can see it there in green in verse 3, and then it occurs again in verse 7, 8, and 9. Now, one of the things that I think that suggests to us um, is that what we have happening here in this text and in this season of Advent is that grace and peace comes through Jesus. And here he describes him as Jesus the Christ or in Christ Jesus, Christ, Christ, Jesus. You know, he goes back and forth. But I mean, Jesus is the center of the gift giving. And that is really what we now are giving thanks for. This is, believe it or not, the only main verb in the entire section. Um, you can see here from um, the, the, uh, the way in which this ends at the, at the very at the end there, you, you do have a new sentence, God is faithful through whom you are called, but there is, no, there is no main verb. So the only main verb is the giving of thanks there in verse 4. And you can see that 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 is one long sentence. And it, it's, a, it's, it's sort of a typical kind of Pauline sort of thing to do. I mean, you can see epi, hati, kathos, this is result. Um, then he's got this participle, which is, I think, where you get maybe one of your main themes, waiting expectantly for the apocalypse, the coming, the revelation of Jesus Christ, speaking of the last times. And th this is an interesting word. Greg Lockwood, in his commentary, suggests that even though it appears as if Jesus is the antecedent here, um, he goes back here to God the Father. And he thinks that that's the one that this hoss refers to. And I think he, he may be very right. I mean, it certainly does put it in a perspective where you can see that this section, which is sort of the apocalyptic section with the language of apocalypse here, the end here, and in the day of the Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ, which of course has always been understood from the Old Testament on to be the, the, the coming of, of Christ and the coming of Christ at the end. You, you can see here that, that the coming sort of collapse that the incarnation and the parousia are really one and the same event. And so it's, you know, th these really do mark in many ways, once Christ is incarnate, the end has come. I, I've mentioned that many times in many of the things that I've written about. But anyway, the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that this is a prayer, a giving of thanks, that is just one long sentence with all these subordinate clauses. Um, let's look at a little bit of the grammar here so we can get a sense of what um, is happening in terms of the grammar. And, and there are a couple of things here that I think are worth our time. First of all, I, I want to I point out that um, these here, in, I put them in italics and in bold, I'm underlining them here in blue. These are aorist passives. You know, the grace that has been given to you. Or, as it says in, in verse 5, that in every way you were enriched in him. You know, past tense, something that happened in the past. Or verse 6, you know, about Christ was confirmed among you. Now, I think these, these aorist passives all are a reference back to either their baptism, their coming to faith that, of course, led them to baptism. Um, this, this is when it was given. And these are things that happened them, to them in the past. And it was something that was in Christ Jesus. I think you really have to see how already here at the beginning of Corinthians, um, th this incorporation into Christ is in view here. It was given to you in Christ Jesus, you know, in, that, that, that you in every way were enriched in him. There's this, this dwelling that happened in the past 
but continues now into the present. So that's one thing to observe. Um, another thing to observe is this genitive here, you know, the witness of Christ. This is an objective genitive. Christ is the object of the witness. And, and what we're talking about here, the witness is the preaching of Christ. And the preaching of Christ is, of course, what brought about faith, what led people to baptism, you know. And that witness, that testimony, was confirmed among you. So, I mean, th these are just a few grammatical points that I think recognize how important this text can be in terms of seeing the, 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 the now, not yet character of the text. And, and you, you've got their baptism, you've got their ongoing life in the church now, and then you've got their looking forward, to waiting expectantly for the coming of Christ again in glory. Now, what's, what's so interesting about this is the fact that there is this very curious statement here, and, and a lot of the commentators make note of this, in every word and in every knowledge, you know, uh, sometimes that's translated in all speech and in all knowledge. Now, one commentator said, this reminds us of Romans, I think it was Greg Lockwood who said this, Romans 10, 9, where you have, if you confess with your mouth, there's the speech, and believe in your heart, there's the knowledge that Jesus has risen from the dead, you will be saved. Now, that's, that's a very interesting comment there. And one, one of, as I said, one of the commentators said, this is actually more than one, this is very much a piece of irony here because perhaps this speech is speaking about the gift of tongues, the, the spiritual gift of tongues. And, and the knowledge is that sort of special Gnostic knowledge that they think they have because they have this gift of tongues. And that, that Paul is in a sense seeing that they're kind of inebriated with this, this speech and this knowledge and he wants to ground them in the reality of Christ Jesus, which is why he refers to Christ six times plus one, if you include the in him here. So he wants them to see that, that the reason why they can wait expectantly for the apocalypse of our Lord Jesus Christ is precisely because the grace that has been given to them is in Christ Jesus and is not something that they have kind of in and of themselves because they have this special speech and this special knowledge. Now, he does have a, a result clause here, which I think is, is very important. You know, the testimony uh, or the witness about Christ was confirmed among you so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift. Now, notice their spiritual gift again, okay? This one is given in Christ Jesus, every spiritual gift. Uh, excuse me, in every gift. I shouldn't say spiritual gift. That's exactly what I don't want to say. That's what they think they should hear here, that the word here should be spiritual gift. Panel, hold on, let me, yeah, well, I'll just, panel matika. That's what they're focused on, are the spiritual gifts. And he wants them to see that the gift actually is something that is given to them that is, in fact, Christ himself. That Christ is the gift that is given. And when you have Christ, who has come, who has atoned for sins, who has done everything that is necessary, then you have every, every gift that you possibly need so that you might wait expectantly for the apocalypse, for the end, for the day of the Lord. Now, I think the, 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 the beauty of this text, especially for Advent, is the fact that we have this last verse, which is so important here for, for understanding this text. And I'm going to just lit, put it down here so you can see it. Um, you can see there's a, there's a period here, so that, that ends, this, this prayer. And verse 9 
is in many ways where I might preach on this text if I were to preach it. God is faithful through whom you were called or by whom you were called and here into the fellowship. And I'd like to translate that communion into the communion of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, this, this is a loaded word, as you know. It's a word that doesn't occur in the Gospels. It first occurs in Acts 2.42, if you're reading straight through the New Testament. And in, in the Corinthian correspondence, it means one of three things. Participation in Christ, and that is obviously a sacramental kind of participation, um, it's also participation in the blessings of the gospel, which isn't a lot different, but you're looking there more at what the person of Christ brings, like forgiveness, life, salvation, as Luther said. And then, of course, there is the, the body and blood itself. And I think there are many commentators who would like you to see that this communion is connecting you to the you know, 1 Corinthians 10 and 11 uh, parts of the text where communion is in the body and blood of Christ. And it's that communion in Christ, you know, which we've anticipated earlier here with the language of in Christ, in him. It's that communion in Christ that marks God as faithful. And this, this is one of the great things you can say about God that it's one of the great attributes of God, that he is faithful to his promises. He is faithful to what he has said he will do. And what he has said he, is, he will do is that by the coming of Christ and the ongoing presence of Christ through baptism and faith in the Lord's Supper and the, the, the testimony of Christ, the testimony about Christ, I should say, that that, that is what makes it possible for us to anticipate Christ coming again in glory and to be ready for that coming when he comes again in glory. So as we, we come to the end of our study, I think it's very important for us to recognize here that as we have this triumphal entrance into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, which is the gospel for this day, we, we see already the end, and that is the cru crucifixion, that Palm Sunday reminds us that Jesus was born to die. And, um, and his, the celebration of his birth, the celebration of the incarnation is really the celebration of the atonement as well. And that prepares us for his coming again in glory. First Corinthians gives us sort of a glimpse of what it was like in a real life church that had all the problems that we know that the Corinthian congregation had and that Paul you know, instead of, in a sense, chastising them as he begins here, he points them in thanksgiving, in a prayer of thanksgiving, to the gift that has been given, and that gift is Christ, and that they can now speak, you know, their speech is the speech of Christ. They now have the knowledge, and this knowledge is the knowledge of salvation that comes through the entire event of Christ, that these things are the, the very stuff of what they need to prepare for his coming again in glory. So the Lord be with you as we begin a new church here, as we begin a new podcast series, that the Lord Jesus Christ, who has come, who is present among us, and who will come again, will bless you with every good gift.